Hello, and welcome everyone to our NGS Leaders webinar. My name is Janine Holly, and I'm the Community Manager for NGS Leaders. Today we'll be discussing de novo assembly of complex plant and animal genomes. There was considerable interest among community members to have a session dedicated to this topic, so we hope you will all find it valuable. valuable. For those of you who've just joined NGS Leaders, we're an online community for people working in next generation sequencing, bioinformatics, and related fields. The community is about a year old and is part of Cambridge Health Tech Associates. I want to briefly mention that NGS Leaders is a sponsor of XGen, which is taking place in March. This year's uh, schedule includes a session on de novo assembly. If you're planning to attend XGen, you can take advantage of the $50 discount being offered to members of the NGS Leaders community. We're excited to bring you this session, which includes three experts as well as Kevin, uh, Kevin, three expert panelists as well as Kevin Davis as moderator. Kevin is editor of BioIT World and he's also the author of a book published last year entitled The Thousand Dollar Genome. I'll turn it over to Kevin now to introduce our topic and our panel. Janine, thank you very much, and uh, hello everybody. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, we uh, have, I think, a, a record crowd for our latest NGS Leaders Web Symposium, which will run 60 minutes. Uh, we've done a number of these over the past uh, 12 months, um, and uh, focusing on various aspects of next generation sequencing technologies, platforms, um, a fair amount of discussion about personal genomics. But today, we're really going to get in the trenches and talk about the de novo assembly of complex genomes, plants and animal genomes, and uh, we're very fortunate to have three, uh, three great uh, presenters uh, and panelists to talk about uh, some of the latest uh, progress and uh, successes and challenges in de novo assembly. Uh, I'll introduce them in just a second. Um, happy to say that all of them will be receiving a signed copy of the thousand dollar genome. I'm sure they're thrilled to hear that. Um, the flood of next gen Sequencing data obviously makes, um, brings uh, to, to light uh, the, the potential for and the necessity for de novo genome assembly, which uh, has critical implications in particular for understanding uh, plant genomes uh, and many other complex genomes which we'll hear about over the course of the next 55 minutes, as well as tackling and um, revealing many complex um, layers and sources of polymorphism in other genomes for which de novo assembly may be the only way to, to get at that particular problem. Um, we've uh, uh, brought uh, to, uh, to the panel today three experts in complex genome assembly and interpretation who are going to share their insights into some of the challenges of de novo assembly of, of uh, complex genomes perhaps talk about some of the latest applications and bioinformatics strategies in genome assembly uh, and discuss the benefits of de novo assembly versus uh, alignment to uh, reference genomes and uh, perhaps highlight some of the key differences between whole genome analysis in plants and in other organisms, including humans. Um, an important point to uh, make this as interactive as possible uh, is that uh, on your screen you should all have access to the chat dialog box, and we absolutely encourage your questions and comments throughout the course of the web symposium. So uh, if at any point during the discussion uh, you have a burning question, please just type away, uh, put it in, and in the second half of our um, program today, we will try to include as many of those questions as we can possibly accommodate uh, before we reach the top of the hour. Um, so uh, it's my pleasure to welcome um, our, our three guests. We're going to have each of them speak for just a few minutes just to introduce themselves, their organizations, and some of their current research interests. Then we'll start uh, broadening out the discussion. Um, in just a few minutes, you'll hear from Jeffrey Rosenfeld, uh, who's a next-gen sequencing advisor at the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey, uh, also a visiting scientist at the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, we're also going to hear from Mario Kakamo, who joins us from Norwich in the UK uh, on the East Coast, head of bioinformatics for the Genome Analysis Center in Norwich, um, which focuses on uh, non-biomedical research, uh, particularly in complex crops, the wheat genome and other genomes. Um, first, however, it's my pleasure to introduce Ian Korf, who is Associate Director of Bioinformatics at the UC Davis Genome Center in California. Ian uh, has had stints at the Sanger Institute in the UK and also at uh, Washington, Washington, the Washington University Genome Center, where he's had um, 
hands-on experience working on uh, a whole slew of genome projects, including mouse, worm, and human. He's also one of the directors and leaders of the Assemble Fund, which I dare say we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about. So, Ian, uh, I'm going to bring you in and uh, like you to get get started. Tell us a little bit about yourself and about uh, uh, life at uh, the UC Davis Genome Center and in the Corf Lab. Thanks very much. Hi. Yeah. Um, life in the Corf Lab is uh, a little bit complicated because we do so many different things. Genome assembly is something that I've been interested in for a long time, but it's not something that has been a major research question in our lab until recently, until the assemblathon. Um, mostly what we do is deal with um, try and do sequence analysis after we have a genome. Um, of course, you know that you really can't do much um, with a genome until you have it assembled in some form. So, you know, that's where my interest is with genome assembly. We need robust genomes that we can do analyses that mean something. Um, some of my research um, is in things like gene finding, sequence alignment, um, motif finding, a lot of the classic um, bioinformatics kinds of algorithms. Uh, we develop those kinds of um, algorithms and also are trying to incorporate as much of this next generation sequencing technology as possible. Thanks, Ian. What's a, uh, just a quick question. So, for the purposes of our discussion, we're talking about complex genomes. I mean, is every um, plant and vertebrate genome a complex genome in this context, or uh, do do uh, uh, the tools of de novo assembly have particular relevance for for a subset of those genomes? That's a good question. I would say that every genome is a complex genome, even. Even the simpler ones are pretty complex. Every genome has its challenges associated with it. There's, there's no easy genome, I don't think. Uh, they're, they're all, you don't know how uh, good a job you've done. It's not like you can take a rocket to the moon and you can land there and say, I've gotten there. It's, it's hard to know when you're actually done. So part of the problem with uh, genome assembly is, is evalu evaluating how well you've done. And, and, just, while, and just while we're uh, talking about complexity, is Complexity and um, the, the sort of saturation of repeat sequences are those. Is that essentially the definition of complexity, or is there some other way of thinking about what makes a genome truly complex? Well, I think historically we have this idea coming up from the first uh, eukaryotic genome that was sequenced was the yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and then from there we went on to worm and uh, Arabidopsis, human genome, Drosophila, and all these cases we were really thinking about them as haploids and not thinking about them as diploids and not thinking about them as populations. But even when we were thinking about them as haploids, it was difficult to consider what is exactly is a genome uh, assembly and how complex is it because you may have, you know, the very first sequence of a yeast genome, it had some mutations in it. So there were so there were genes that were broken. But of course when people went in there say, hey, you know, this is this is this legitimate gene, it just has a mutation in it. And just the idea like, you know, is this a mutation is this a pseudogene or is this just a mutation in a normal gene? And that kind of definition introduces complexities about what exactly do we mean? Do we mean this sequence right here is the genome or do we mean in a more sort of metaphysical context the sequence is you know, this genome with its genes repaired to some degree, or to the whole population of genes with their um, genes repaired or not repaired to some degree. And we start thinking about, you know, genomes in terms of populations, even the very simplest genomes become very complex. That said, there are some genomes that if they were considered just haploid and only considered one, you know, one, all the genes, you know, in their native state in one haploid genome, they still would be complex because there's a heck of a lot of repeats and there's pyrology and so there's complexity on a number of different levels here. Okay, excellent. Uh, sit tight, we're going to bring in um, our second guest, uh, Mario Kakamo from uh, the UK. Uh, he's the head of bioinformatics at the Genome Analysis Center, TGAC, cleverly named in Norwich, <laughs> uh, funded by the BBSRC, the Bio Biotechnology and Biological something or other, uh, which focuses on non-biomedical research. Uh, Mario is a computer scientist. He's had uh, also um, uh, a stint at the Sanger Institute. Um, he's also uh, a co-author on the uh, recent uh, report on the, uh, the first results from the Assembler Fund, which we will get to, and uh, has uh, extensive experience working in assembly and annotation of a variety uh, of model organisms. Uh, Mario, welcome. Uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, about some of your research interests. 
Great, thank you very much, Kevin, for the introduction. And as you said, I'm working here in TIGAC in, in Norwich in the UK. This is a relatively new center. We've been around for a couple, I mean, two and a half years. And our focus, as you just said, is on, on trying to bring, if you like, all the power of these next generation sequencing technologies to, to the, the world of plants, animals, and microbes with a really focus on non-biomedical applications. And uh, really what we want to do is really going beyond the consensus. Very much what we are going to be talking today is about assemblies, but our view of how we can use sequencing is really trying to bring the, you know, the use of sequencing as, as assays for, for biological experiments. And that's what I have in my second slide in my introduction. Really, our view is that we need to tackle uh, you know, biology from all angles and sequencing and, and bioinformatics will be key for, for that. Now, talking about complex genome architecture, I want to introduce here a, a kind of a, a newcomer, which is the wheat genome, which we've been talking about haplotypes and, and diploids and things like that. Now, the interesting thing about wheat is that it brings this complexity coming from a polyploid genome. In particular for wheat, what we have is, is that three different hybridization events the first one four million years ago, the last one very close to where, where wheat was um, domesticated and just for, for food production, that we have in that genome three subgenomes coming together, uh, what we tend to call, I mean, there's a name for that, is the A, B, and D genome. These are very similar in terms of gene content and, and the gene, if you like, uh, gene similarity, when you align them, they're, they're, very, they're very similar, but they're different, and they have, they have different functions. Now, this uh, if you like, aspect of polyploid as add a bit to the complexity that Ian was talking about uh, before. And we have, if you like, a new concept here, which we call homologous features rather than just homologous. And these homologous features refers to the fact that you will have genes which are common to the ABD genome, which will be different. And part of what we're trying to do is, is within the, the, the international with genome sequencing consortium is, is trying to help to tackle this complex genome. And one of the projects we're I mean, the current pressure we have at the moment is sequencing every, every chromosome arm of this, of this complex genome independently, and it's part of a big process I have in my fourth slide. Now, as part of the introduction, I just wanted to mention that we are working as well on our own assembly algorithms, and this, we have one assembly algorithm, it's called Cortex, and that's the one we use uh, for the assemblathon, that's something was mentioned before. This is a collaboration with Sam uh, Iqbal in the University of Oxford, and our view of this uh, kind of uh, how to approach assemblies as a uniform framework to as well understand variation, and that's what, it, what I have in my fifth slide in this introduction. Right, I'm just looking forward to, 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 to have a good discussion today. So thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, Mario, just tell us a little bit more about what the, uh, I mean, obviously wheat is an important food crop. Just to very briefly uh, bring us up to speed, where, where are you in terms of uh, producing a full assembly of the wheat genome? Right, there is an international consortium working towards generating what we call a gold standard uh, for the wheat genome. And, and that goal is, you know, a few years uh, ahead in terms of, I mean, we need to still work hard to get there. And it's going to be following a clone-by-clone -clone approach, which some people might think it's old-fashioned, but to tackle a genome that is 80-85% repeat is really the only one you can get a really good gold standard. In the meantime, though, we're trying to help, if you like, the community by providing a whole genome shotgun assemblies for uh, the chromosome arms that can be flow sorted independently. And that's very much an intermediate solution to be able to provide the community a sequence to, for example, generate markers, work into applying these tools for perhaps crop breeding. But really, to, for that gold standard, we're working together with this large international consortium, which includes partners from all across the, the globe. And, you know, it's going step by step by generating first a physical map for every single chromosome arm, and from there selecting clones that will be sequenced independently and assembled independently. Okay, great. Uh, we may get some questions uh, in particular about uh, you know, some of the some of the aspects of, of, of plants and even wheat uh, genome assemblies. So, uh, so hang on, Mario. Um, let's uh, welcome our third panelist, uh, Jeffrey Rosenfeld, uh, Next Gen Sequencing Advisor at the uh, UMDNJ, also visiting scientist at the American Museum of Natural History. I'd like uh, 
Jeff, maybe you can just uh, briefly uh, touch on on, on uh, what you're what you're doing there. But I know that your main research interest is uh, 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 well, certainly you're part of the Thousand Genomes Project and um, uh, studying uh, non-SNP, non-single nucleotide polymorphisms. Uh, in other words, more complex layers of polymorphism uh, for which uh, de novo assembly may be the only way to go. So, Jeff, welcome. Thank you, Kevin. So. I'm mostly working at the UMDNJ, working in a bioinformatics core, working on all types of sequencing projects. But at the Museum of Natural History, I'm doing a lot of work on bacterial genomes. The museum's purpose is to, to understand all of life and categorize things. And basically, where we are with bacteria today is where we were with mammals 100 years ago, just putting names on things. And so doing a lot of sequencing and assembly. The assembly of the bacteria is pretty simple because bacteria are generally small genomes. The tools work for them. But the main thing I'm going to talk about is the human work. So the question, so I don't do assemblies so much. I mean, my focus is that assembly is needed for a bunch of reasons. So look at my second slide. So part of the thing is I'm looking at non-SNP polymorphisms, things like MNPs where you have what you would call two SNPs next to each other, or you have multiple SNPs. You have complex variants where you have an indel on one strand on in one allele. The other allele has a SNP, and there's no clear way of finding these things using a reference genome. The other important thing is if you look at this recent Rhabdopsis paper that I wrote about on a blog and other work of Evan Eichler, that there's a lot of non-reference sequence that people aren't looking at. If you look at the human genome, there are the 23 chromosomes, and then there's these random regions that nobody really looks at, but that there could be a lot there. There could be a lot of genes that people are missing in those regions. And the other thing that makes sure about is you have things like this slide about frame restoring indels. You have, you look at this, you put, pull this up in a view of these sequences, you would think you have two frame shift indels, one here with this G and one further down of 17 base pairs, when in fact, instead of having two, in, two you, you would think you have a frame shift and therefore it's a non-synonymous variant. In fact, what's going on is that you have, just have a deletion of six amino acids. And so things like this, you don't pick up with just straight comparisons to a reference genome. So that's why I think there's a big push in the need for doing assembly. Thanks, Jeff. Um, and MNPs, so that's multiple that's nucleotide right. polymorphisms, correct? Right. So if you have, in one sequence you have an AT, the other sequence would have a GC at a position. The problem is normally people just look at, look at every nucleotide change individually as a SNP, but if you find two base pairs changing or three base pairs changing, you would call it not synonymous. But if you look at each individual SNP, but if you looked at two or three together, it's really synonymous or it could be totally different. So, and, and how much progress can you just sort of sum up, uh, um, you, you know, where are we in terms of cataloging this type of variation? So with the thousand genomes we're going through, we're looking at these variants. I mean, there's, those, there's straight MMPs are an easier class, are a small class. There's also things where you have two SNPs and then you have two matching base pairs and then another two SNPs or things like that, you have all kinds of complex things. So we're working on that. Part of the problem with doing this is that it's dependent upon the alignment. What norm, what normally what you'll do is you sequence the gene, sequence your, 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 your sequence your genomes, then you align it to a reference, and this amount of variation will not align very well. And so that's another reason why you have to do some type of assembly to really get these things well. But in 1,000 genomes, we are we are doing, for the phase one project, we're, sequence, we're going through some individuals, we've identified these MNPs, and we're doing some validation on sequinome and PacBio to, to see how well we have done. Okay, Jeff, thanks very much. Um, let me throw out a few questions. I want to get quickly to the, to the aspect of, of tools and strategies, but um, just a couple of questions to get there. And this is really open to uh, all three of our panelists. Um, but uh, Ian, I'll, let me come back to you and start with you. Um, what, what's the, uh, can, can you summarize what's the added benefit that you get from assembling a genome de novo as compared to just doing read, uh, aligning reads? I'm sorry, was that a question to me? Uh, yes, Ian, could you, yeah, I'll start. So we'll start with you. Yeah. Uh, what's okay. the added benefit you get from assembling a genome de novo versus just doing standard alignment? Oh, well, the, with the reads, sometimes there's a lot of questions you can't ask at all with reads. You need to have an assembly. There's so many things that, um, you know, when you have a even a, a poor assembly, um, 
is sometimes useless. If if your contigs on the on the average are you know something like two kb and the genes in your organisms are stretched over four kb, you don't even have single genes on there. I mean, at, at the very raw level of just having a bunch of reads, the only people that really make use of that kind of information are people who are doing metagenomic studies, and they're 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 not even asking questions about you know, what the sequence is necessarily of each organism, they're more interested in saying, you know, which biochemical pathways exist in this particular sample from this environment. Um, they can't ask much more than that. They can't ask about populations very easily. They don't even know which, you know, if, if there's, what, how many different organisms there are. That's, when you have a bunch of reads, you're, it's even hard to, to sort out contaminants from your actual genome, and there's always going to be contaminants in your bunch of reads. So. I mean, a lot for me, personally, sequence analysis starts after uh, genome assembly. You can't really do much beforehand. Mario, uh, I, I take it you really don't have a choice. You, you've, you, you're, you're obliged, really, to do de novo assembly when you're working on genes like the, uh, genomes like the wheat genome. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah that, that's correct. But maybe I want to add something in terms of, you know, you asked before what's the advantage of doing assemblies over just alignment. Sure. I think that was your question before, and I can maybe elaborate more on that. There are regions, even in, in well-finished genomes, right, like the human genome, that it would be very difficult to access through through alignments, in particular if you have that they're highly variable, right? And that's one maybe it's, it's one example of uh, an application where using uh, you know assemblies can help you to really resolve those regions, right? You might have enough coverage. And you might have enough coverage to assemble a, a region that could be highly variable. If you try to align the reads directly to the reference, you might fail to, to get good alignments based on, you know, the fact that you, the, the regions are highly variable. But if you can assemble things independently, and in particular if you can get some local assemblies, you might, you might be able to resolve that. And something which I think Jeffrey mentioned as well, is there will be as well sometimes regions which are completely novel in a particular individual, and the only way you can resolve that is by really assembling the novel. Perhaps you don't need to do an assembly of the full genome, but you know, if you can localize a region of interest, pick reads of that region and try to assemble that and resolve that independently, you can get access to information that through alignments would be very, very difficult. Now, coming back to the plants, you're absolutely right. Uh, in the case of the wheat genome, which is a very complex genome, uh, we need to really rely on, on de novo techniques and by generating perhaps small contexts, which in the, in, in the context of maybe the human genome, they, they wouldn't be that useful. But for us, in the plant world, sometimes what we need to do is just try to have, you know, develop tools that could be good enough to develop good markers. Now, those markers can be used for breeding, and you don't need to have large context for that. And we've seen that sometimes that, you know, with first-pass assemblies, we can generate context which perhaps won't be of, you know, very large, few, few k bits, not even getting to 10 k bits, but those are good enough for, for example, uh, to develop markers that can be used for downstream analysis, like breathing, right, which is crop breathing, which is a, a con concrete application. Jeffrey, uh, let me put the same question to you. Uh, w from your perspective, what benefit do you get from from doing de novo assembly? I, I'm guessing, I'm taking it, that the de novo assembly can be done on human genomes. Is that correct? Well, de novo assembly is pretty hard on human genomes. I'm going to do a full de novo. The best thing that you get complete genomics and their sequencing, they do local de novo when they find things that don't look like they're matching them exactly SNPs or exactly an indel. I think that's the critical thing is not just looking at aligning and looking for SNPs. Is doing some, there are, some people can, if you look at all paths, they did a de novo human assembly, but it's very hard to really do a full human de novo. Possibly you could do reference-based assembly on humans. Okay, thanks. Um, Ian, I want to come back to you and um, have you talk a little bit about the assemblathon, which uh, uh, the first um, set of results, I, my understanding is, have just been published in uh, Genome Research, and it's uh, an open access article, so everyone can uh, have access to the full text. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the, the origins of this uh, uh, assemblathon one, and, uh, and maybe what some of the highlights and some of the results and conclusions were? Sure. The uh, Assemblathon 1 started um, from the Genome 10K project, which is a um, – G10K is, is a, an effort to sequence 10,000 vertebrate genomes, and this would create just a huge wealth about a whole bunch of vertebrate biology. We'd know a lot more about ourselves and a lot of the you know, creatures that we care about. And really, in order to, to sequence and assemble 10,000 genomes, you kind of want to know what is the best 
sequencing technology and assembly technology for you know for the amount of money that you have uh, it definitely becomes a cost benefit ratio when you're looking at ten thousand uh, genomes and not looking at just one so the um, it was uh, Joe Derisi and David Hausler um, and some people at Lumina originally that started this um, idea of, of let's let's make a, a two two targets one would be a real genome this is a boa constrictor snake and a synthetic genome and then in the synthetic genome we could really determine how well we did and then in the real genome you know people would have something to play with that would be kind of new and novel as it turns out that the, the data wasn't ready for the snake genome so assemblathon one was just the synthetic genome so it turned out that uh, what, what was done was to uh, take a copy of human um, chromosome 13 and then artificially evolve this over a million years using the Evolver software. It's very sophisticated software that introduces mutations in different regions of the genome at different rates depending on how they were annotated. So coding regions would have a totally different evolutionary model compared to repeats or introns or upstream regions and these kinds of things. So the, the, the sequences that came out of that were human-ish, but after 100 million years of evolution, they, you know, they didn't look that much like the human genome anymore. And then one of the additional challenges in this was that not only was there a um, one genome that was evolved, but there was a one million year diverged uh, haplotype of that, and then another reference genome. If people wanted to use a reference genome to assemble one genome with reference to something that was known, there was another genome that was given the genome B um, that was something like in 60 million years or whatever uh, was um, different. So um, people then were given this collection of synthetic genome reads. So we took the synthetic genome and then chopped it up to make synthetic reads. And then the challenge in Assemblathon 1 was to try and put this all together. And because we knew exactly what the answer was at the end of the day, we could evaluate each one of the assemblers and see how well that they were doing. The end result of that was that a lot of the uh, assemblers did a pretty good job but um, it's di more difficult to assemble the regions that had more mutations in them. So coding regions assembled much better than some of the non-coding regions. Um, but Assemblathon 2, it, when we started thinking about that, people really wanted to do a real genome. They didn't want to do synthetic genomes. And that's when Snake came back in, and then a Bird was added, and also a Fish. So, uh, so Assemblathon 2 actually has three real genomes in it. it Disadvantage is that we we don't know the answer in the end, so evaluation is much more difficult. So, are there some tools that have really uh, y you know uh, sh shown uh, uh, proven more successful than than other tools? I mean, can you, for the benefit of the nearly 200 people on the line, I mean, uh, can you give us sort of a um, you know a, a, a guide as to uh, you know what what tools seem to, by consensus or or, or by acclamation, seem to be uh, uh, proving uh, uh, good ones at least based on the current state of the field? Do you mean by tools? Do you mean by genome assembly tools, or do you mean yes, mean exa yes, exactly. Tool? Okay, uh, start off with assembly. Okay, for assembly, um, there's a number of of tools that are doing a pretty good job. I think that one of the things is that we found is that sometimes two different groups will use the same assembler, and the group that knows a bit more about the assembler will do a slightly better job. There's genome assembly is. Um, somewhat of an art at, the, at this point, and there's a lot of different parameters that go into your genome assembler, and choosing those wisely is difficult and probably should not be att attempted by amateurs. If you have a genome that you want to go sequence, you should contact one of the major sequencing cent and, you know, centers who are doing a lot of assembly and get them to help you. Doing it on your own without anybody's help is pretty much guaranteed to give you a suboptimal assembly. So. Uh, when you're, when you're thinking about what tool should I use, should it be this one or this one, it actually is a much more complex equation than that, and it begins all the way back at library preparation. You don't want to choose your assembler as the last thing you do. You want it to be done in conjunction with what is the sequencing technology, how are the libraries made. It's a, the full uh, equation has to be considered. You can't do it stepwise. Maybe if I can add. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Go ahead, Mario. Yeah, something which I wanted to add, I think it's very, very wise work coming from Ian. Just 
Another factor we sometimes we need to, to, to wait as well is the time it takes to run these tools. And I can give you the example uh, of the 21 chromosome arms we are trying to assemble, right, as part of our project for the Wheat uh, Genome uh, Consortium. And, you know, we had to wait as well there how long it took to run every assembly tool because we had limited time and we wanted to generate, in this case, the first pass assembly and working. And if a tool took, for example, weeks, even if it gave us a good result after weeks, it could be too long, and we wanted to really get something that the community could use very quickly. These tools can take long time to run as well. That's another thing I wanted to, to mention, really. So, Mario, this another point is also that the computational resources they take are pretty extreme. They, most labs wouldn't have that level of computational. Yeah, it's a very good point, yes. Uh, Jeffrey, would you just maybe you could just elaborate on that uh, because I think that's a question that's going to come up, is, which is, you know, what are the sort of the IT and computational resources needed to to run these? Uh, have uh, can, you know are people running into problems on that on that score? I haven't done many of these assemblies. I just know that you look at the requirements. They want hundreds of hundreds of gigabytes of RAM and huge amounts of processors and lots of storage space, which just you either have to have you have to have a very big machine or have access to one of these supercomputing centers to do it. And like in my particular lab here, we, don't, we just don't have the resources. Even if there are big computers, we just couldn't run one of these assemblers on a human-sized genome. Ian, uh, coming back to you, could, uh, two things. But first, can you follow up on that uh, line of questioning? Do, do, what, what are the, some of the, the, uh, the, the IT issues? Do you find this to be a, a potential um, a bottleneck? There are definitely IT issues. Um, this is another one of those cases where if you're a bit of an amateur, going at it by yourself is not necessarily the best uh, plan. So I definitely think that you don't want to just jump into genome assembly thinking that it's just like any other bioinformatics problem and that people can just, you know, hack together a solution with a few Perl scripts. This is, uh, if you want, it, it's garbage in, garbage out uh, in a lot of different areas of science and especially in genome assembly. and and taking the informatics part of it seriously is very important, and, and having some kind of collaboration with a major center is probably where it should start right now. Maybe 10 years from now, we'll have some software packages that people can do everything themselves, but I don't recommend that now. During the assemblathon uh, process, did you um, evaluate any commercial uh, assemblers? Are, are, there, are there any commercial assemblers, or is this all being driven by the academic community and uh, in open source uh, platforms and so on? There are a few um, commercial assembly packages. You'll probably see more of those coming out. I imagine many of these academic uh, people will spawn off some kind of commercial type of thing. Um, CLC has their own assembler. That's one of the, I think, probably more famous commercial packages. They were not officially entered into the assemblathon, but we actually ended up running their software behind the scenes as a means of we were able to do that. We have the software here, so we wanted to check that out. Some of the things that we did in assemblathon one, actually, and we did with some commercial software, the software is intentionally make bad assemblies. We didn't know what necessarily how good assemblies would look, so we wanted to make some really bad ones just to make sure that we had something to compare it to. So we didn't always run the other people's software in the best way. Um, it was just as a as a way of measuring against it. We don't intend to enter the competition and beat anybody as the evaluators. Um, we would happy to put up, you know, straw men for people to beat, though. Okay, excellent. Uh, we're about halfway through our discussion. Uh, we're starting to get questions through from the audience in the uh, in the chat uh, dialog box. So I urge you to uh, uh, keep keep uh, submitting your questions. I'm going to try to get through as many of these as we can because uh, these are obviously the, the more specific uh, and often technical questions uh, that uh, you want to, to hear about, and we're going to get into those into that uh, in just a minute or two. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this is the uh, NGS Leaders Web Symposium, De Novo Assembly of Complex Plant and Animal Genomes. And uh, I'm Kevin Davis. We're talking to Ian Korf from the UC Davis Genome Center, Mario Kakamo from TGAC uh, in uh, the UK, the Genome Analysis Center, and uh, also with us is Jeffrey Rosenfeld, uh, Next Gen Sequencing Advisor at UMDNJ, all who have uh, hands-on experience in uh, uh, 
uh, genome assembly of complex genomes. Um, uh, we've spoken, I think, for the most part, we've been focusing on, on you know, uh, uh, actual genomes. But I wonder about, let's just briefly talk about uh, uh, transcriptomes and transcriptome uh, uh, de novo assembly. Um, is, this, uh, is this an important area? Is this something that people are, are, are actively doing? Maybe, Jeffrey, I can, I can talk to you about that first and bring the others in um, uh, 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 afterwards. Yeah. Some people are doing it part of, for trying to identify splice junctions. That's the main way you, you do that. I think that that's a much simpler problem because the number of RNAs is much smaller than the size of the genome. But I don't have much hand-on experience doing it. Maybe Ian or Mario has done more direct RNA seq and out assembly. Uh, right. We we are we have a couple of projects working on that, and the challenges we see in particular around transcriptome assemblies is, as, as it was mentioned, really Jeffrey is, is the the splice type and splice forms. And there's another uh, important issue around transcription assemblies, which is the notion of a coverage, because that changes as well. You need to be really careful in how you prepare your libraries to make sure that dominant transcripts will be you know, put at bay. They won't really take over your samples, because they will affect this notion of coverage, which is much better understood when it comes to uh, you know, uh, genomic uh, assemblies. Right. Ian, you want to say add anything to that? Yeah, I'd like to add something to that. And that is that um, for a lot of the reasons that people are interested in genomes, they're often interested in uh, what the genes are in those genomes. A lot of times with the polymorphisms and, and genome rearrangements and structural variants and that kind of thing, those, the things that are interesting are how those affect the genes. And really, genome annotation is a harder problem than genome assembly. Um, it's, it, it, it's going to cost more money eventually. Sequencing and assembly is going to be the cheap part. Actually getting a good annotation of where all the genes are, that's difficult, really difficult. And uh, the best way to get your foot in the door on that is to have really good transcriptome assembly. Not just transcriptome sequencing, but enough transcriptome that you can have an assembly. So I would tell anybody who was going to start a genome project that they should also be doing a transcriptome project. You can't have one without the other. Um, and it used to be that people would do the transcriptome instead of the genome because it was a lot cheaper and lots, lots of legacy EST sequencing projects. But today, you really want to have them both, do them both. And when it comes to the transcriptome, you probably want to do both some kind of reduced representation so that you can try and get a little bit deeper. Um, and you also want to do um, non-normalized kinds of um, stuff because you might want to know something about the different levels of expression. So the transcriptome, the sequencing and assembly of that, it's also a complex equation, and it's something that really should be addressed at the same time as genome assembly. Just one point on what Ian was saying, if I can step in, is that what's very important is to make sure it's the same individual or the same, at least the same strain of individual that you're doing the RNA-seq and the genome sequencing from, because you have a lot of cases in human where you try to align reads from a certain cell line against the reference, which is very different, and then things don't align because there's such differences between the genomes. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I want to, uh, I'm going to start going through the questions that have been submitted from the audience, so please keep them coming. We're going to get to as many of them as we can. Um, Tim Smith asked about uh, longer reads, specifically from PacBio, and does, does anybody on the panel have experience incorporating PacBio reads into genome assembly? I perhaps, if not, I'd like to broaden that um, uh, and have you uh, address, you know, in, gen in principle, what, what difference, uh, what, what benefit is having longer reads, whether it be from PacBio or from uh, you know, Nanopore technologies, which are on the, uh, on the fringe of being uh, commercially available. Um, uh, you know, what, what benefit is, are those longer reads going to have in terms of de novo assembly? Um, who would like to take that first? Right, I can, I can start maybe yeah, talking a bit about that. We now the way the way I, I see these new technologies, you know, the packed biotechnology, which is now something which you can you can get is, is a pro, but as well the other one you mentioned uh, along the lines is that by getting these longer breaks, we're going to be able to resolve some of the complex regions we we have at the moment very difficult to to, to, to tackle with the short reads, particularly repeats. Now, one of the issues we see in these technologies is that the in the new technologies offering these longer reads is that the error rate is, is quite high. Now, what we really see is a way of perhaps complementing the current deep sequencing technologies like Illumina, Solid, or, or perhaps 454 with these longer reads to be able to resolve those, those complex regions. What I'm trying to say here is that these uh, longer reads 
most probably won't contribute to the sequencing per se, but they will contribute to resolve the structure of, of the sequence. I need to say here that still it's very early days, and I don't, I don't know, if, I mean, maybe other, the other panelists can, can comment on that of any a tool that can do this effectively. I know that people are trying to do that and are trying to, to resolve that, this idea of complementing, you know, what we can do now with deep sequencing technologies with this longer reach to be able to resolve the, the complex structures. I think this is something which we need to keep on trying and look into the future. I'm sure people will come with, with new tools soon, but there's nothing really at the moment, as far as I know, that we can use to do this integration. Have you worked with PacBio, uh, Mario? Uh, yes, we have, a, we have a machine here in-house that we are now experimenting, right, with that. And clearly, you can achieve these long reads, which are fantastic. But as I said before, the error rate of this read still is, is a bit of an issue, and the kind of errors is another issue. And they tend to be insertion deletions, which are harder to, to deal with with bioinformatics tools. Uh, Jeffrey, and I'll bring uh, uh, Jeffrey first. And I'll bring in, in, in uh, just talk about the, the the upside of longer reads. I can just ask Mary a question. What type? Which people probably want to know what type of what level of error are you finding in these reads? Well, we're finding what is reported widely, which is around 10, 15% error rate, right? Which is not just us. Everyone is getting roughly the same, the same error rate. Yeah. But still, look, the, the long reads look really promising. In particular, we're talking about things between 5 KB up to 10 KB, which are really promising in, with this idea of being able to resolve uh, complex repeats or, or maybe being able to sort and orientate context uh, over longer scaffolds. Jeffrey, have you been uh, uh, to, to briefly talk about the the benefit of, of longer reads in your in your uh, area of research? So I've done some work on is in bacterial genomes. The the longer reads help you close the genome. It is you, you just take a genome and a limited sequence. You're going to get a decent assembly, but you're not going to be able to fill in all the gaps. If you do some a low, some packed bio, you should be able to fill in most of your gaps in the genome fairly simply. And Ian, do you want to talk about that? Let me let me do something funny, okay? I'm just going to send something to everybody just for fun. This is uh, just in terms of what, is, what does it mean to have a long read versus a short read. So I just posted this ridiculous piece of uh, text to all participants, mm -hmm. and what you see here is a paragraph of my of one of my papers that I've written that has been broken up as if it was Illumina data, okay? So. Um, there are very short reads, and they don't have a whole lot of errors. Okay, so this is what Illumina sequencing look like. If you were to think about what does PAC bio sequencing look like, you would see something that looked like this. There's 85% error, but the sentences are long enough that we can read them. Yeah. We can we can sort of figure out what does this what is this what is this about. We can. It's easy to do. So at Genome Assembly, when you start to have longer reads, we'll get much much easier. The whole game, you know, will be completely changed when we have reads that are in the order of 10 KB or something like that. It's no longer uh -huh. going to be, uh, I just want to, um, right now a lot of, of what's going on, the way the assembly algorithms are work, people are so focused on the individual uh, bases, they're really using this kind of KMER based approach, and so those are really requiring each one of the, um, you're linking up these identical KMERs to each other. And it doesn't really take that kind of approach. It doesn't really take advantage of the length. I think we almost have to go back to sort of earlier ways. I mean, Mario was talking about going back to sequencing, you know, clone by clone approach, and the overlap layout consensus approach is kind of an older way of sequence assembly. But maybe that actually works better when you're starting to talk about when you're talking about reads that are in the multiple KB. Then your overlaps are gigantic, and you can really get some more robust assemblies. It's going to be the genome assembly community. Super smart people, lots of cooperation there, lots of good competitive spirit, and I'm pretty sure they're going to figure out how to use third generation technologies. Um, right now, the third generation technologies are hard to use. People don't know how to use it. They haven't had enough time to figure out how to put it all together, but they will figure it out pretty soon. So. Um, that part of it is, you know, if you need your genome done today versus tomorrow, it's always the case, whether it's computers or technology of some kind, you know, if you just wait a little bit longer, it gets cheaper and better. But at some point, you do have to make the decision and you need to go with something today. So um, when you're thinking about your genome project, what you're going to get three years from now is going to be a lot better than what you get today. But there's still some pretty good solutions today. Uh, Ian, have you been, uh, uh, do you have hands-on experience with uh, the PacBio platform? 
Yeah, we have a PAC bio machine here. We were at the UC Davis Genome Center. It was one of the first um, places to get a commercial unit, and we've been using it for a variety of different things. In terms, um, we haven't been using it for genome assembly, but um, there's a number of interesting questions that we can ask that you can only answer when you have really long sequencing reads. So we're looking at things like um, the structure of centromeric sequences that are very, very um, repetitive, and we want to know what those what the structure is in the, on the long range. Um, also, um, Paul Hagerman is working with uh, Fragile X um, sequencing through those repeats. So there are certain things that PacBio can do that nobody else can do, and we like those things. And um, yes, there's you know there's errors, but you know, better better to be able to ask the question with a few errors and have to do a little bit of hard of analysis than not being able to do it at all. Uh, absolutely. If I can maybe add something there, in, in the in the wheat community, one of the things we need to to deal with is is what is called nested transposons elements, right? Which are quite quite difficult to to tackle when you have short reads. And our expectation is that using these long reads, we're going to be able to connect uh, coding regions through these complex repeats. To be honest, we don't really want to resolve these repeats to the you know to every single base, but we can find, if you like, the the larger organization, the structure of of the text very much as, as, as um, Ian pointed with his example, that's going to be very good for us. We can really orientate context, we can organize uh, genes around these complex repeats uh, with these long reads that we hope will span the full repeat at, at once. All right, we have about 15, maybe 20 minutes at the most uh, left in our discussion, um, and I'm going to now just uh, plow through the questions which have been uh, uh, flowing into the into the chat box and continue to, to uh, uh, to continue to come. So um, let me just go back to one that came in a bit earlier from Danielle. Um, not a question that can probably be answered succinctly, but I'm going to ask our panelists to try to be as succinct as they can so we can make sure we get through just about everything that's been submitted. Um, Danielle wanted to know what genomes are hard, perhaps she meant particularly hard, to de novo assemble with available tools, why, and what methods are being developed to, to address those issues? Um, Ian, can I start with you? Your perspective on that? Sure. I think that um, the very first part of genome assembly is getting your DNA out of whatever beast you're talking about, and that is non-trivial. Not every genome has the, is the easiest to get your DNA out of, and it's really garbage in, garbage out. There's so much that is dependent on having really high-quality sequence and making your libraries correctly. We talk about you know comparing assemblers to each other, but at the recent Assemblathon meeting, people were actually considering, hey, maybe we should have some kind of library construction competition because to them they think that's even more important in some ways. So what mixture you use of the different library side, you know, you know, how far apart your pair end, made end, that kind of technology, those kinds of um, decisions are critical and they depend a little bit on the kind of genome that you're doing. If you have absolutely no idea about what kind of genome you're doing, you know, your genome is, then you probably don't want to even be thinking about that. You need to do a little bit of exploration to figure out what does my genome look like. And you can actually do a pretty decent exploration of a genome with just a little bit of sequencing. One of the things we did with the Pine genome is that we sequenced um, 10 backs. This is David Neal's group at UC Davis. Um, uh, they sequenced 10 backs and then also did some next generation sequencing. And by looking at how those reads piled up on those backs, we got a pretty good idea about the repeat content of the genome in general. And it's totally not what we expected. The Pine genome is 20-something, 20 22 gigabases. It's gigantic, three times the size of the human genome. It's definitely a complex genome. But when we looked at those repeats in there, we noticed that they were all really highly diverged from each other. So maybe it's not as hard to assemble because the repeats are so different. There's a lot of, of the sequence space that actually looks unique at the level of genome assembly where you're talking about things are supposed to be 99% identical. The repeats aren't 99% identical, so they're not really going to be a problem as much to the assembly software. Another shocking thing that came out of that is that when you think about a complex genome, you think about you know, maybe the human genome and it's 10% alu, or the corn genome and it's, you know, I don't know exactly what percentage, but there's a huge percentage that's all the you know, one transposon type. The pine genome, the most common repeat, was only 3% of its genome. No way of knowing that going in. And then the next most common one is 1.5%. 1 so until you've done a little bit of pilot sequencing, you would never really know that. So it's, you don't want to just go into this saying, hey, I've got this brand new genome, let's start planning our library sizes. There's a little bit of homework that you should do ahead of time to get an idea about um, you know, general GC composition of that genome and um, other factors. 
Yes, I couldn't agree more with, with you, Ian, on that. I mean, something which you will see people writing in papers is trying these different exercises. Now, trying a good collection of different exercises for, to generate your, your parents or long-made parents is, is key to, for example, span complex repeats. But it's not always, always possible to, to achieve good, I mean, get these good sequences if you haven't really had the chance to get good DNA, right? It's very hard to get, for example, long inserts if your, the quality of the DNA is not very good. And, and, and the other point I wanted to perhaps rescue from what, what Ian said, which I think is, is quite, quite important, is this notion of going for a pilot. And that's something which we are implementing here as well as part of our, you know, routine, uh, routine uh, how we tackle uh, new genomes, right? We don't go and just develop a full project from beginning to end with all the exercises. We try to understand what's going on. We maybe run one lane of Illumina, and that's going to get easier with the new machines, like the MySeq and these smaller machines. Really trying to understand the complexity of, of, of the genome you have in hand before you embark in the full process, I think, is, is key. And, and pilot processes are really fundamental for that. Thanks, Mario. Jeff, did you have anything to add to that? No, I, I mean, agree with that. There's a lot of work, that's what Ian has been saying, that you can't just take your genome, send it to Illumina, pick an assembler, and try to get it. There's a lot more work that goes into this, trying to figure out what is its size. I think that is a key that you have to figure out people have to look at what insert sizes work and what size libraries and what to do, whether you need FOSMIDs or BACs or what you need to do. That's a very important area of research that needs to be undertaken. Okay, um, Aris has a question for all of the panelists. Which software do you recommend for large, in other words, more than 1,000 or 1 megabase and, and more than 1,000 contigs uh, for contig alignment? Any specific software recommendations? MOVE yep. can be used for that. MOVE is uh, something that Aaron Darling has um, developed to, to look at um, comparing genomes to one another, and those genomes can be contigs, collections of contigs. That was MOVE? MOVE, M-A-U-V. All right. Uh, Mario, Jeffrey, any other, uh, any other nominations? So can, you, can you repeat the, the if you like, the specs you yes, were talking about? Uh, Aris was asking, which software do you recommend for large contig alignments, meaning, for example, more than uh, a megabase, more than a thousand contigs? Yes, we, we've been sometimes using BLAT. BLAT tends to work very well as well. BLAT, uh, with like, I mean, large alignment. You need to understand how you're going to play with your, your, your different parameters, but it tends to work really well, yes. Okay, let me uh, move on. Uh, uh, another question, uh, who is working on making assemblies more, run more efficiently? I've noticed the question says that many of the codes don't scale well with respect to the number of processors. Anyone? I think this is, this is, okay, go ahead, Ian. Sure. Um, different assemblers have there's a number of different assembly algorithms out there. there even though most of them right now are, are using De Bruyne graphs, um, which operate in a three-step procedure of first error correcting, then graph layout, and then graph navigation. Each one of those procedures, error correction, um, graph layout, and then the graph navigation, is a little bit different from each one of those. Error correction, there's lots of different ways to do that. But the part that's really, it's the navigation at the end. They, they, they should, theoretically, all produce the exact same graph if they've all been given the same input data and filter it the same way. But that last part of graph navigation where you've got all of the sequences in there and all the relationships of the different k-mers to each other, and then they're trying to spit out a haploid genome, and the haploid genome doesn't exist. I mean, they're coming from a diploid. What you have to realize is about these genome assemblers is they're trying to create the haploid genome. That's still what we're trying to do, generally speaking. But these, the input wasn't a haploid genome. So the thing that you get out is slightly artificial. I think eventually people will do diploid genomes, but that's not really the focus right now. People are more interested in getting just out a haploid reference. So this thing that you get at the end doesn't exist from the two parent, from the two parent um, haplotypes. And so trying to, trying to navigate through this structure of repeats, polymorphisms, and other stuff to give you one true assembly that you can use a reference is a difficult problem. And the, lots of different software are taking lots of different approaches here. So um, it's they and they have different ways about do, go about going about doing that. So things like memory requirements and number of CPUs and how much time it takes, like that. There's a lot of things going on very differently for each program. 
some of the algorithms are designed specifically, like the um, the sequence graph assembler from um, Sanger, is uh, designed to work with 32 gigs of RAM on cloud computing, whereas other assemblers are assuming that they don't really have a, a memory limit, and so maybe they're assuming that they'll use whatever they can. And so with a large genome, you might need a terabyte of memory or something like that. It's, I, I think that there's so many different approaches being taken right now. It's very experimental. It's hard to ask them to be optimizing memory at this point. Okay, let me move on to another question. Um, uh, probably for Mario, uh, c can you compare the sequence assembly between a heterozygous genotype and a homozygous genotype of the same plant species uh, if that species is a tetraploid? Right, I mean, that's a good point. In general, what we do, and that's an advantage with plants, is that we work with uh, fully homozygous um, uh, individuals, plants, and that's really an advantage. Now, I had the chance to previously work with the Stibrafish Genome Project in the, at the Sanger Institute, and one of the challenges we had with that project was that it was, it was really, we were using an, a library which was highly heterozygous. And already we had problems when we were trying to put together, for example, the bugs, because different bugs were maybe coming from different haplotypes, and the overlaps were not really, you know, what you expect. There were differences in the overlap. Now, with plants, we can really deal with that much better because we can get these fully homozygous plants. I mean, assuming that you're working with a, with a species that is self-compatible. And many of the species we're working, they are. It's interesting because in some of these models, like the zebra fish, with the ears, the you know, people working, you know, in, in the lab, they managed to get, in some cases, double, fully uh, double haploids. And that's what, for example, we had access for the zebra fish genome project uh, towards the, the end of the, my time at the Sanger, we had access to a bug library which was built on a, on, a, on a fish that was fully homozygous and was something which uh, I think was a lab in, in, in University of Oregon, Puffles Way, John Puffles Way managed to create that particular, you know, DNA, I mean, individual from which we, we extracted DNA and we created those bug libraries. Coming back to the point, in plants we tend to work as much as we can with fully homozygous um, species. For example, for the wheat uh, genome project, though we have a hexaploid, what we're talking about here is three different haploids because the A diploid, the B diploid, and the D diploid, they are fully homozygous. Okay, thanks. Um, back to Ian, a question about Assemblophon 1. Uh, how complex was the synthetic genome in Assemblophon 1, asks Jonathan. That was as complex as human genome chromosome 13 would be. So pretty complex in terms, I mean, human chromosome 13 is not a particularly gene-rich uh, chromosome. Uh, there's a lot of repeats on there. It looks basically like a lot of the rest of the human genome. It would be like assembling the human genome, but uh, it was a smaller, you know, smaller. So, but it would be probably just as hard. Okay, thanks. A uh, question from Satya I want to get to, um, and I'm just going to read it. We recently sequenced a tuber crop using 454. The raw data was assembled by a company, uh, gave us the aligned contigs as ESTs. We screened using BLAST and eliminated all the contaminations. When it was published online, she received a co he or she received a comment saying there are still viral contaminations. I would like to know if the raw data can be useful to eliminate these contaminations before assembly. Any takers on that one? I would think it would be easy just to take the we take the reads and you search against E. coli and all the standard genomes pretty quickly. You can do that with the reads and then eliminate those reads before you're doing an assembly. It's much easier to do that rather than trying to filter it out once it's assembled. I would think. Sometimes it's hard to know that at the end. Like um, some of the contaminants that come through are not going to be cloning vectors. Some of the contaminants are going to be creatures that are living on your organism, like you might have aphids coming through on some kind of plant or something like that. So um, sometimes what you do is you do your genome assembly, and then afterwards you align a, a bucket of your reads back there, and you will note that some of your contigs may be entirely assembled, some insect or something like that. That can definitely happen. Um, one of the ways um, that you can try and find various kinds of contaminants is by the read depth. When you sequence your favorite genome to a particular depth, you might have decide, oh, I'm going to sequence that to 50x coverage, and then you find something else in there that's consistently around 5x coverage, that could definitely be a contaminant. Um, and sometimes a simple blast search will tell you um, what that is. But it should be noted that when you go for 50x coverage, 
due to the various differences in GC composition of different parts of the genome, and depending on what sequencing technology, you may get variable representation. So that even if you are aiming for 50x um, coverage, there's some parts of the genome that you only get in 5x coverage. It's well known that there are problems um, in GC-rich regions of underrepresentation. So it's not just the simply the things that are at low coverage are going to be contaminants because there is a you know a distribution of coverage depth over the genome that is not completely uniform. Yeah, and we've seen sometimes the other way around that contamination gives you high coverage. I mean, we've been sequencing, yeah. for example, aphids where you know these aphids are famous for yeah having some endosymbionts, and those endosymbionts because they're smaller genomes. They are overrepresented. I think, I mean, very much, uh, you know, following what you just said, Ian, looking into, you know, some uh, bias in the in the coverage will be pointing to some potential contamination. Looking as well into, as you mentioned, GC coverage, Kamer distribution, that's another way. But to be honest, it's still a bit of an art how we really find these contaminations early on. And sometimes the safest way is just go do the assembly and try to screen at the end because if the species is enough, I mean, far removed in terms of evolution, they most probably will assemble contents which won't really be contaminating your, the contents of the species of your interest, right? All right, we're heading, uh, we've hit the top of the hour, we're heading to overtime now, so I'm going to hopefully our panelists can just stay with us for another five minutes or so. We'll try and squeeze in a few more uh, questions uh, as we uh, hit extra time. Um, a question about optimal and suboptimal assembly, which we've been talking about. In the context of de novo assembly, uh, how would you assess and how would you assess and evaluate uh, whether your assembly is optimal or suboptimal? Any views on that? Ian, can I start with you? Sure. Uh, I think probably one of the, if you're interested in genes, probably the best thing to do is to look at the gene content of your assembly. So. A good assembly will have all of your transcriptome. Remember, we did have a transcriptome project with our genome project. Those transcripts that were assembled in part of the transcriptome project should align perfectly to your genome. And if they don't, your genome assembly might be incorrect. Of course, your transcriptome assembly might be incorrect um, as well. But in general, you should get good agreement between your transcriptome and your genome if you have a good assembly of both of them. Uh, one of the things that we use in the absence of transcriptome is we use highly conserved proteins. So we published a paper about how to do this a while ago, and we, for the Assemblathon 2, we created a slightly larger set of all the vertebrate genome genes. And so you can, for your particular clade, maybe it's higher plants or something like that, collect probably 500 proteins that are incredibly highly conserved across all those plants. So every plant will have these, your plant will have them if you're sequencing a plant, and if you can find those proteins, you, know, you can just use some you know, typical protein aligner like BLAST-X or t blast if you want to go the other way, and you should be able to align your proteins to your genome. And if you can't, you can't find them, there's probably something wrong with your genome assembly. I want to go back uh, to another IT question. Um, is there a place for GPUs in assembly algorithms? Anyone care to offer a view on that? I can do that one again. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, go ahead. G who, who's, who, who's going to take this one? Uh, I mean, Ian, go ahead. I mean, I, I can very briefly tell you that uh, we still, I mean, still is very dynamic in terms of we, I mean, in general, we use GPUs for problems we, we really un understand very well. I mean, programming things in GPU is always trickier, right, because it requires, you know, in, inside knowledge and how you put things in, in, in this in this new bit and running very quickly. What we found is still we need to work at the very low level of how the data structures are put together. And we haven't really achieved, if you like, mature data structures, data types to, to be able to move into GPUs. But I would say that yes, why not? I mean, we need to look into that. Two more, two, maybe three more questions, then we'll, we'll uh, bring this to a close. Uh, it's been a fascinating conversation. Um, Taras asks, assuming you know nothing about a species when you start a new species de novo, what combination of library sizes would be recommended for the most efficient first pass de novo assembly? Anyone? I would say, yeah, I'll take that. Don't, don't start there. Start earlier. Try and figure out something about your genome before you start making your libraries. Absolutely, and just to say I mean, just something to repeat something I said before. Even if you think that 10 KB, 20 KB insert libraries will help you, you need to make sure that your DNA will support that kind of libraries, right? Okay. Um, 
uh, the question, Mario, that's come in a couple of times, so it's obviously important to the questioner. Uh, what was the motivation behind your upcoming Nature Genetics paper, which is entitled De Novo Assembly and Genotyping of Variants Using Coloured De Bruin Graphs? Right, yes. Yeah, there's a couple of things I wanted briefly to say here. One thing is that we tried to argue in that paper that assembly and variant discovery are two faces of the same coin, right? If you're trying to deal with one thing, you're implicitly doing the other thing. And we try to put these two ideas together in one framework. And the idea of using color the brain graphs is that by really being able to encode the data very efficiently, we manage to get more than one sample, or if you like, one individual in the same graph, and we can achieve that idea of variant discovery in one framework. Okay, excellent. Well, I think we've gone through most of the um, most of the questions that have been submitted, and I want to thank uh, uh, all of our three panelists for their uh, really tremendously insightful contributions. Uh, Mario Kakamo from T T uh, TGAC uh, in the UK, uh, who where he is head of informatics. Jeffrey Rosenfeld uh, from UMDNJ, the uh, a next gen sequencing advisor. Thank you, Jeffrey, and Ian Korf uh, from California, UC Davis Genome Center. Uh, Ian is Associate Director of Bioinformatics. Uh, I dare say you can contact them uh, individually if you uh, have uh, specific questions that we didn't have a chance uh, to get to. Um, and I want to thank them all. I really hope we can bring this panel together again. We had, I think, a record number of participants, almost 200 uh, uh, midway through our discussion, which is fantastic. Um, I also want to thank uh, my colleagues at NGS uh, Leaders, uh, Janine Holly and Alison Serrano, for all their uh, efforts in putting this together and making it run seamlessly. Um, and uh, particularly thank everyone uh, still on the line for, for attending and making this a success. Uh, NGS Leaders is your forum. It's a community forum. Um, it's free for everybody to uh, attend and in particular to contribute to. So uh, we're always eager to uh, uh, consider ideas for, for blogs or discussion forums or product reviews, um, do, do uh, take a minute to just uh, look around the website and, uh, and contribute uh, because there's so much uh, collective expertise uh, and insight here that I think uh, this really ho hopefully will provide a useful forum for people. So with that, uh, I just want to say thank you again for everyone for joining us today. Um, we've had a fantastic uh, discussion on de novo assembly of complex plant and animal genomes. I'm Kevin Davis uh, from BioIT World. Thank you all.